the autonomic nervous system is the um, last subset we'll look at here underneath the peripheral nervous system. It consists of the sympathetic side and the parasympathetic side. The autonomic nervous system only innervates the smooth muscles, the cardiac muscles, and the glands. It has no effect on skeletal muscle, and it makes sure that we maintain homeostasis uh, through a subconscious control mechanisms. Compared to the somatic side, which monitors skeletal muscle and, and activates skeletal muscle and allows us to be aware of perceived sensations and only uses one neuron, the autonomic side uh, picks up subconscious or unconscious perception of visceral sensations. It will stimulate or inhibit smooth muscle. It will stimulate or inhibit cardiac muscle and it will stimulate or inhibit the release of secretions from various glands. For example, in the heart, the autonomic nervous system can uh, cause the release of acetylcholine through the vagus nerve, which will slow down the heart, or it can stimulate the release of epinephrine through the cardiac nerve, which will speed up the heart, neither of which we have any control over. The biggest difference between the automatic and somatic sides are that in this autonomic nervous system is that you need two neurons to connect the effector with the central nervous system. You have what's known as the preganglionic and the postganglionic neurons. The, central, the autonomic nervous system, the preganglionic neuron, the cell body, is found in the brain of the spinal cord and it has the first axon that comes out is myelinated and that uh, will continue out to the autonomic ganglion located right here and then from the from the autonomic ganglion out to the effector you have the postganglionic neuron which is unmyelinated and that will connect to either cardiac muscle glands or smooth muscle now the the difference between the somatic side and the autonomic side deal with the effectors, the pathways, and the neurotransmitters, and just how do the target organs respond to the neurotransmitters. In the somatic nervous system, the effectors are always going to be skeletal muscle, but in the autonomic nervous system, the effectors are either cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or the various glands. In the somatic nervous system, the pathway is a heavily myelinated motor neuron that uh, goes directly from the central nervous system to a skeletal muscle cell. But in the autonomic nervous system we have two neurons in the chain. The preganglionic neuron is lightly myelinated whereas the postganglionic neuron is unmyelinated completely. In the somatic muscle motor side, the neurotransmitter is always going to be acetylcholine. The effects of acetylcholine on skeletal muscle are always stimulatory. Skeletal muscle is always excited when acetylcholine is released. In the autonomic nervous system, we have both the release of acetylcholine and norepinephrine. The preganglionic fibers will always release acetylcholine. The postganglionic fibers will, all, will release either norepinephrine or acetylcholine. And the effect is either going to be stimulatory on the receptor or inhibitory, depending on what type of receptor we have. So here we can see, here is the somatic uh, nervous system. We have a cell body with our axon here going down to an axon terminal releasing acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction and we see we stimulate skeletal muscle cells to contract. But in the autonomic nervous system on the sympathetic side we have two we have an, a the preganglionic axon is myelinated and it releases acetylcholine at the uh, at the synapse and at the autonomic ganglion and downstream from that we have the unmyelinated postganglionic axon and we release norepinephrine. 
So the sympathetic side is going to be stimulated, well, it's going to release acetylcholine on the preganglionic axon at the autonomic uh, ganglion. And then on the postganglionic side, it's an unmyelinated axon that will always release norepinephrine. On the parasympathetic side, we will release acetylcholine at the autonomic ganglion. And you'll notice again, it's a myelinated preganglionic axon. That's the same as it is on the sympathetic side. But here, our unmyelinated axon downstream of the ganglion is going to release acetylcholine. So the sympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system will always release norepinephrine to the, to the receptor site. On the parasympathetic side, we will always release acetylcholine to the receptor site. Receptors are going to be the same receptors. They're the gut, they are glands, they are smooth muscle, they are cardiac muscle. And again, just to emphasize, it's always going to be acetylcholine here at the autonomic ganglion. But what's going to be released from the postganglionic neuron, the unmyelinated neuron, is either going to be acetylcholine or norepinephrine. Now the sympathetic side and parasympathetic side are generally antagonistic. However, many of the organs in the body, particularly the visceral organs, are going to have dual innervation because there can be both Ha they can either have a sympathetic response or a parasympathetic response. Areas that are antagonistic are going to be the heart, for example. We have sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons that are going to innervate the heart. The vagus nerve is a parasympathetic nerve that's going to release acetylcholine into the heart and slow it down. The sympathetic uh, side uses the cardiac nerve to dump epinephrine into the heart and cause it to speed up. Sometimes they're complementary. For example, in the mouth where we uh, secrete saliva, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic side will stimulate the salivary glands to secrete saliva. And sometimes they work together but they have different results or different effects to get the same result. For example, micturition, the need to urinate, we have stimulation that can control the release of the sphincters, but one sphincter is under autonomic control and one is under, uh, I mean, one is under sympathetic control and one is under parasympathetic control. Now, there are areas that are not under dual innervation. For example, the adrenal medulla, the inside level, inside portion of the medulla, uh, adrenal gland, is only stimulated through the sympathetic side. The adrenal medulla is where epinephrine and norepinephrine are produced. The erector pili muscle that stands up when we get cold or when we get frightened only responds to sympathetic innervation. Sweat glands only respond to sympathetic innervation. Blood vessels either dilate, that means they get bigger, or, con or constrict, which means they get narrower, are usually only stimulated from the sympathetic side. And when we shiver to get warmer, that's also only controlled by the sympathetic side. The parasympathetic side is the rest and digest and relax and defecate side of the autonomic nervous system. When a person is um, under control of the parasympathetic side, our blood pressure will be low, our heart rate will be low, our respiratory rate will be low, but our gut activity will be very high, particularly if we've had a large meal. We're busy processing out and digesting the food that we've eaten, uh, breaking it down, and being it, starting its transport uh, in, from the small intestine into the blood. Our pupils are usually very tightly constricted, and we're, our lenses are designed to focus on things that are close to us, our close vision. Uh, our nearsightedness, if you will, is, is very high. The sympathetic side, on, on the other hand, is the fight or flight side. This allows us to fight, flight, or fright 
Sometimes we act, sometimes we don't act, and sometimes we are paralyzed. This allows us to respond, though, in some way when we become frightened. When we go into a fight-or-flight response, we send blood to our heart and to our skeletal muscles, to our lungs, and to our brain. We don't bother sending any blood, extra blood to our digestive system. We send it away from our skin. We send it away from our gut, from our reproductive system, from our urinary system. One of the reasons during a fight-or-flight response is that afterwards we feel very cold because we pull blood away from our skin. During a fight-or-flight response, the smooth muscles around our airways, that's the bronchioles, will relax and our airways will enlarge, let more air come into our lungs, bringing in more oxygen and getting rid of more carbon dioxide. Our liver will release more glucose, so we have more glucose for energy. We will release norepinephrine from the postganglionic fibers. So our sympathetic response involves our unmyelinated axon releasing norepinephrine onto the smooth muscle, for example, uh, to stimulate uh, vaso, uh, vasodilation or, vas uh, or vasoconstriction. We will stimulate the uh, bronchiodilation or bronchioconstriction and we will release epinephrine from the adrenal medulla. In the sympathetic side we will respond with any kind of stress. For example, in an emergency, in an, when we're embarrassed, if we're excited, when we exercise. And so in all these situations uh, whether it's a fight-or-flight response or whether we are dealing with embarrassment or excited, uh, we will see our pupils dilate to let in more light so we can see better. Our heart rate will increase, the force of the contraction will increase, and our blood pressure will go up. We will send less blood to the non-essential organs like our kidneys and uh, our skin uh, and our reproductive structures. We will send more blood to the skeletal muscle and to the cardiac muscle. We will open up our airways and increase our breathing rate, and we'll see a rise in our blood glucose levels. And this effect will last. Norepinephrine stays in uh, the synaptic gap there between the uh, uh, post-ganglionic neuron and the receptor site, and also due to the release of norepinephrine from the adrenal gland. When sympathetic effects, our gut activity drops. We don't process food. We're not worried about our food right now. Our sphincters contract. We don't want to have any accidents. We also contract sphincters that control the blood flow uh, to our skin, for example. We send large amounts of blood away from our skin where we can use it in our brain and our lungs. We relax the detrusor muscles and the ciliary muscles uh, the eye changes, the lens changes its shape so we can see better. And our pupils will enlarge dramatically. We want to be able to see everything we can see. On the parasympathetic side, we generally don't have an entire systemic response. The parasympathetic side uses acetylcholine as its neuro neurotransmitter it causes us to relax. Unlike when it hits skeletal muscle, acetylcholine causes cardiac muscle to relax. It lowers our heart rate. It tells blood vessels in, in the gut to dilate. It tells us to process food faster. We increase the activity in our gut to digest food and break it down and start sending it out where our cells can use it. In the parasympathetic side, we will cause bronchoconstriction. Our airways will narrow. We don't need to worry so much about that air because we're not doing anything strenuous. We are in a rest and digest mode. We are going to recover our energy. We're going to uh, conserve our energy. We're going to rest. The parasympathetic side is the dominant side. It dominates over the sympathetic side. Instead of the E responses, we have what are known as the SLUD responses. Salivation, lacrimation, urination, 
digestion, and defecation. We see a decreased heart rate, we see a decreased airway diameter, and we see a decreased diameter of the pupil. However, one of the things that happens to us when uh, we are extremely terrified, when we're extremely scared, we go well. We, we go past the fight or flight response from the sympathetic side, and we are now in a point where there is a, we're essentially in a no-win situation. There is no way out, and our sympathetic system is then activated with a massive systemic response, and we generally lose control over our ability to urinate and defecate. <clears throat> so instead of having the normal responses we get from the sympathetic, parasympathetic side where we urinate when we need to and we defecate when we need to, we lose control of, over our sphincters and our bowels and our bladder will generally empty uncontrollably when we are that terrified. What's happening here is the parasympathetic nerve fibers in the, in the pelvis will tell the sigmoid colon to start contracting and contract rapidly. The anal sphincter lets go and we have a powerful, not just a regular defecation response, we have a powerful defecation re response where the bowels are emptied rapidly. So no matter how hard you're, the individual is trying to not empty their bowels, those bowels are going to come empty no matter. Uh, the, it, these parasympathetic stimulus overwhelms uh, any effort uh, to try and keep the anal sphincter shut. Now comparing the sympathetic side to the parasympathetic side, we can see here is the, uh, the cardiovascular system, the heart, for example, and the uh, uh, veins. The sympathetic side increases the heart rate. It constricts the blood vessels. It causes bronchioles and airways to dilate. It uh, has. It tells the gut to not respond uh, to do anything. But what we see here is the parasympathetic side has the opposite effect. The parasympathetic side tells our stomach and intestines to become more active. The parasympathetic side tells the liver to undergo uh, glycogenesis to manufacture more glucose. The parasympathetic side tells our gallbladder to become more active and release bile to break down the fat. The parasympathetic side tells our kidneys to get more active in making filtrate that's going to become urine. The parasympathetic side tells our bladder to contract and uh, force urination when it's ready. And the reproductive uh, organs can be stimulated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic side. Uh, in males, it will cause erection and ejaculation. It will also trigger uh, the orgasm in both males and females, and it will trigger erection of erectile tissue in the female also. Okay, now let's. Here shows you where our pre and post ganglionic neurons are located. Here is our parasympathetic side and our sympathetic side over here. And on the parasympathetic side, our preganglionic neurons are usually very long and our postganglionic are very short. And over on the sympathetic side, we see that the preganglionic neurons are short and the postganglionic are very long. Now we also have reflexes that take place in um, the autonomic system. In the autonomic reflex arc, we have a sensory receptor, a sensory neuron, an integrating center, a pre and post ganglionic motor neuron and a visceral effector. Very similar to the reflexes we would see in the somatic side except we have that, that extra neuron in here where we have the pre, pre and post ganglionic neurons present. We also are not aware of these 
visceral reflexes. We change uh, our blood pressure in response to a stimulus. Uh, we change digestive functions. We defecate or empty our bladder uh, under reflex action. We're not aware of this. Again, the visceral reflexes have the same parts, same components as the somatic reflex, except that it has two neurons in the motor pathway going out. And here we see a visceral reflex pathway where your sensory receptor out here in the viscera, somewhere in the gut, here is our sensory neuron coming in, comes into uh, the central nervous system there in the spinal cord. We have our integrating center right there. And then we have our output here coming out. And that's the first of the motor neurons. And that's the preganglionic neuron. It comes out to the autonomic ganglion here. And then we have our second neuron, the postganglionic neuron, coming out to the visceral effector out here. Now, as I said earlier, the neurotransmitters in the autonomic nervous system are going to be either acetylcholine or uh, norepinephrine. Now, we have a new term here called cholinergic fibers. Cholinergic fibers will are the neurons that release acetylcholine. All of your autonomic nervous system preganglionic axons are going to be cholinergic fibers. So, as you remember, the pre and post, the, the preganglionic axons for the, the auto, for the sympathetic side and the parasympathetic side are always going to release acetylcholine. So all of your, your preganglionic axons in the autonomic nervous system are always cholinergic. On the parasympathetic side, all of the postganglionic axons are cholinergic. Now, the neurotransmitter norepinephrine is released from the adrenergic fibers. Your sympathetic postganglionic axons are going to be adrenergic. That means everything downstream of the autonomic ganglia. So the second neuron in the sympathetic side will be adrenergic, releasing norepinephrine. Now there is an exception. Uh, the sympathetic postganglionic neurons uh, will Will, or will release acetylcholine only at the sweat glands. And there's a couple uh, places around blood vessels and the skeletal muscle, but that is the exception to the rule where the sympathetic side, the postganglionic neurons here, will be ad adrenergic, releasing norepinephrine. So here we see it again. So this is, this is the sympathetic side. That is a cholinergic fiber there and an adrenergic fiber there, releasing norepinephrine. Adrenergic comes from the old term for epinephrine adrenaline. Here we see on the, the parasympathetic side, this is a, a cholinergic preganglionic axon and a cholinergic unmyelinated postganglionic axon. Now the receptors since we have cholinergic fibers releasing acetylcholine, we have cholinergic receptors for acetylcholine, and we have adrenergic receptors for norepinephrine. And the receptor sites can be in the same location. For example, here is a preganglionic neuron in the autonomic nervous system. We know it's going to release acetylcholine because they all release acetylcholine. Here we have what are called nicotinic receptors. And over here, we have, in the postganglionic side, we have what are known as, uh, we see the adrenergic receptors receiving norepinephrine. Nicotinic receptors are going to be the name of the receptors that, release, that receive or respond to acetylcholine. So they're called nicotinic receptors here. Over here are the adrenergic receptors. So cholinergic neurons are going to release acetylcholine from the preganglionic side and from the parasympathetic postganglionic side. They can be excitatory or inhibitory. 
and it all depends on what we're, we're uh, having an, an, an effect on. The receptors are either going to be nicotinic receptors or they're going to be muscarinic receptors. Now nicotinic receptors are found on all dendrites. Nicotinic receptors respond to acetylcholine only. They're found on the cell bodies of the autonomic nervous system cells and we have nicotin nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. So as I said, acetylcholine can be excitatory or inhibitory. It's nearly always excitatory in skeletal muscle and the receptors on the motor end plate are going to be nicotinic. But nearly everywhere else, acetylcholine is going to be inhibitory. If you dump acetylcholine into the heart through the vagus nerve, it will cause the heart to slow down. So wherever we have a nicotinic receptor, we are going to have we are, we are going to be able to receive acetylcholine, but the responses are going to be different. Now the muscarinic receptors are going to be found on all of the parasympathetic effectors. So whether we're depending on what we expect what depending on what we expect the acetylcholine to be doing, we're either going to have the nicotinic or muscarinic receptors located there. So why the term nicotinic and muscarinic? Well, they're based after they're named after the drugs <coughs> that will mimic the effect of acetylcholine. Nicotine binds to these receptor sites and mimics the stimulatory effect, for example, of acetylcholine on skeletal muscle. Nicotinic receptors. We see them on the motor end plates of our skeletal muscles because we want our skeletal muscles to become excited. We see nicotinic receptors on all of the ganglionic neurons uh, on the sympathetic and parasympathetic side because remember acetylcholine is always dumped out at the autonomic ganglion so they have they're going to be nicotinic receptors there we find nicotinic receptors in the adrenal medulla where we make epinephrine and norepinephrine when acetylcholine lands on nicotinic receptors it's always a stimulatory response so consider back at this slide If you consider this slide here that we've seen examples of before, oops, let's get back to that. The problem of recording in real time. This is, these have got to be nicotinic receptors here and down here because they're always going to cause some sort because they always excite the postganglionic axon to do something. In this case, it's going to release norepinephrine or it's going to release acetylcholine. So these are nicotinic receptors here and here. At the ganglion there and at the ganglion here. Acetylcholine will always be excitatory on nicotinic receptors. Now the muscarinic receptors can go either way. They can be excitatory or inhibitory. Any of the effector cells stimulated by the postganglionic cholinergic fibers, meaning the unmyelinated second neuron, they're going in the in the parasympathetic side. Uh, they are going to if they're if they're releasing acetylcholine on the para, on the postganglionic side, they've got to be parasympathetic. So we release acetylcholine, uh, and if they land on the muscarinic receptors, the response can either be inhibitory or excitatory, depending on the receptor uh, type. For example, nic muscarinic receptors, we can stimulate the sweat glands, we can cause vasodilation, which is inhibitory, in 
skeletal, in blood vessels and skeletal muscles. Now certain drugs are going to block these receptor sites. Atropine, for example, is it referred to as an anticholinergic. It blocks muscarinic receptor sites. So if you, we know, by going back here, we can see that the acetylcholine, if it lands on a muscarinic receptor, it will trigger sweat glands, it will trigger salivary glands. We, what we want to, we give someone atropine, what that will do is to inhibit, when, it, when atropine lands on the muscarinic receptors, it blocks th that site for acetylcholine to land on, and so we don't salivate, we don't drool when we're having surgery. Also, if you've ever had an eye exam where they've dilated your pupils, they drop atropine uh, into your eye, and atropine lands on the muscarinic receptor sites uh, at, for the muscles uh, that, con the, that control uh, the, the opening of the pupil, and they block that. So now your pupil is going to relax. It's not going to contract, it's going to relax, which is normally going to be a sympathetic response but now we block the effect of the parasympathetic side, we block the effect of the acetylcholine, and we see our pupils dilating. The, 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 uh, the drug used to treat myosinia gravis, it inhibits the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. So now we can have a stimulatory effect by releasing more acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. So here we see some drugs and their effects. For example, nicotine. Nicotine uh, will land on uh, the uh, nicotinic receptor sites. Nicotine normally uh, will raise blood pressure and it will uh, cause vasoconstriction. But what we do here is we use nicotine, or we, we use doses of nicotine at various levels to get people to stop smoking. Here we see certain drugs uh, like pilocarpine, uh, mimics uh, acetylcholine, where we try to get the uh, aqueous humor to drain more, because glaucoma, the eye condition where you have too much pressure on the eye, caused by an accumulation of uh, fluid in the aqueous humor, the first chamber of the eye, uh, we try to get that to drain better. Now in the sympathetic side, the adrenergic receptors are either alphas or betas. And the effect of the norepinephrine on the adrenergic receptor is going to be based on whether you have a lot of alphas or a lot of betas at the uh, target site. Norepinephrine only comes out from the downstream or postganglionic neuron on the sympathetic side. Remember, it's always acetylcholine on the preganglionic side for both sympathetic and parasympathetic. It's going to be acetylcholine on the postganglionic side for the parasympathetic. It's only on the postganglionic sympathetic side that we get norepinephrine. It can, and it has an excitatory or inhibitory response depending on the type of receptor. If they're alpha one and beta one receptors, you're going to get, get going to get excited. If they're alpha two and beta two, you're going to be inhibited. And if it's beta three, you're going to shiver. You're going to warm up through thermogenesis. One of the advantages of norepinephrine is it will stay in the synapse longer than the acetylcholine does. Now here we can see, here are some of the receptor sites for the, for the adrenergic receptors. Beta-1, found in the heart. Uh, when norepinephrine lands on a beta-1 receptor, it causes the heart rate to increase. Uh, beta-2, found in the lungs, it causes uh, dilation of blood vessels and dilation of, of bronchioles. Beta-3 stimulates uh, breakdown of fat. It's only found in the fat cells and cause, causes uh, 
lipolysis or breakdown of the fat cells. Alpha-1 uh, found in the blood vessels going to the skin, going to uh, all of the organs, sympathetic target organs except the heart. It causes blood vessels to constrict. It causes sphincters to constrict. And it causes the pupils of the eyes to dilate. Alpha-2 causes a release of, uh, it, uh, or inhibits the release of insulin, but it stimulates uh, blood clotting. So th five different receptor types, all adrenergic, all different responses. Now, if you take, if you have a cold or you have an allergy, if your head's congested because of all the pollen that's floating around right now, you might go to the drugstore and buy a packet of Sudafed or uh, any of the other medications that are out there. Those drugs usually stimulate the adrenergic, the alpha adrenergic receptors. If we go back here and look at our list, you can see what they do. You know, your alpha receptors are going to control. Uh, they're primarily constrict blood vessels. Now, that's a good thing if your nose is running and your eyes are watering and your head's congested. When blood vessels are dilated, they become very leaky and they leak a lot of plasma out. That plasma uh, moves into your nose uh, and it causes congestion in the sinuses. It can, uh, causes congestion in the nasal cavity and it causes your nose to run. And so if we block that, if we, if we block that uh, that release by constricting the blood vessels, we say our head dries up. So we would look at taking some over-the-counter medication that would have some sort of a uh, alpha adrenergic effect. Beta blockers, on the other hand, are going to land on the beta-2 receptors uh, and cause dilation of airways. So, example, any of the uh, inhaled uh, uh, drugs like albuterol that we would take to uh, cause va uh, bronchiodilation, they land on the beta-2 receptor sites in the airways and they cause our lungs to open up. And we see here, for example, albuterol. Uh, by albuterol, the stuff that's in the inhaler, lands on, uh, dilates our bronchioles, lands on the beta-2 receptor sites, uh, and our airway opens up. And here's Sudafed. Sudafed causes our uh, blood vessels to constrict because it lands on uh, uh, the alpha-1 receptors and when we constrict our blood vessels they don't leak as much. Here is a very popular um, blood pressure medication called beta blockers. Uh, you know it's marketed under the name atenolol or here it's known as propanolol. Uh, it lowers the heart rate and the blood pressure because this particular drug lands on the adrenergic receptor sites and blocks the uh, release of norepinephrine. So your heart rate goes down because uh, your blood your heart your blood your heart rate goes down. Now we know that most of our organs are dual innervated. In here, so we can see both inhibitory and excitatory responses on uh, both uh, from both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. The sympathetic system will cause the heart rate to go up, our breathing rate to go up, and inhibit the gut and you know the urinary system. And whereas the parasympathetic side slows down the heart rate, slows down the breathing rate, allows us to digest and defecate. When they cooperate, they cooperate usually in uh, the reproductive system. In the external genitalia, for example, uh, parasympathetic fibers are going to cause vasodilation of blood vessels, allowing more blood to come into the penis, allowing the penis to become erect. In addition, in the female, the clitoris, which is analogous to the penis in the, the, in the effect that it will also become engorged with blood and erect, is also controlled by the parasympathetic fibers causing dilation of the blood vessels going into the clitoris. So now we have an erect clitoris and an erect penis. 
The sympathetic side works at the same time by causing ejaculation of semen from the male and in the female's vagina the the smooth muscles lining the vagina will contract in a rhythmic pattern allowing the semen and sperm to be delivered up into the uterus and while the sympathetic uh, fibers cause uh, orgasm in the male they will also cause orgasm in the female and this pathway here uh, which we'll talk a lot about in AP2 where we see uh, the when we when the, a person is sexually aroused we see a parasympathetic stimulation is affecting uh, in this case a male the arterioles that control erection in the penis will become vasodilated uh, the mechanoreceptors will be stimulated through touch and uh, we will see a blockage of the sympathetic uh, control here but ultimately we will have uh, the ejaculation which is the next step here that we don't see in this uh, through a sympathetic response now just like we have muscle tone we have sympathetic tone we allow the sympathetic side to maintain a slight constriction of our blood vessels so that we may maintain a constant blood pressure even when we're at rest and since we're not aware of this that's we're, this is classic evidence of the autonomic nervous system at work our blood pressure isn't fluctuating uh, when we're at rest we try to maintain a constant blood pressure when we are <coughs> under stress our sympathetic fibers will cause our blood vessels to constrict that causes our blood pressure to go up when we are at rest the sympathetic nervous system doesn't fire as frequently and so our blood vessels can dilate and we can lower our blood pressure the alpha blockers that we could take uh, uh, to treat blo high blood pressure work by interfering with this vasoconstriction vasodilation we can lower blood pressure by keeping the uh, the blood vessels more dilated than constricted on the parasympathetic side the parasympathetic side tends to control or regulate the heart the gut and the urinary system it's, it will normally slow down our heart uh, by releasing acetylcholine through the vagus nerve into the heart if we release too much acetylcholine into the heart on the vagus nerve the heart can slow down to the point where it stops and the parasympathetic side tells us what is normal activity levels for our gut to process food we don't have to stop and think about processing what we've eaten now this can be overridden by the sympathetic side when we're stressed when we're in a fight-or-flight response however we also know that the uh, there are drugs that can override this also anything that blocks our parasympathetic side can increase our heart rate uh, for example uh, some of the uh, cold medications that are that cause vasoconstriction also increase the heart rate uh, some drugs also make it difficult for us to retain feces uh, or retain our urine other drugs uh, for example some of the uh, uh, the morphine based uh, pain medications uh, slow down or in uh, truly uh, enhance the para uh, inhibit the parasympathetic response controlling the gut and one of the consequences of taking long-term pain medication is severe constipation now what is the sympathetic division control only it has an effect on the adrenal medulla on sweat glands on the erector pili muscle on our kidneys and most of our blood vessels whether we constrict or dilate our blood vessels is going to be a function of the sympathetic side the presence or absence of norepinephrine how do we respond to heat do we sweat that sympathetic side is going to control that releasing renin from the kidneys now renin is a substance in our kidneys that tells us 
to either it can raise our blood pressure and it can increase our blood volume. The sympathetic side also tells our metabolic rate to speed up. It can also release more glucose from the liver and uh, tell us to burn fat at a faster rate. Parasympathetic side effects are going to be short-lived and localized, whereas the sympathetic side will be long-lasting systemic effects. And the reason that the sympathetic side is longer-lasting is because the norepinephrine breaks down slower than the acetylcholine. The norepinephrine and epinephrine have to be destroyed in the liver. Acetylcholine is broken down very quickly thanks to the, to the acetylcholinesterase. Now the autonomic nervous system, the overriding function that controls that is the hypothalamus. And it is through uh, the hypothalamus, which sits directly below the thalamus, that we have all of our uh, sensory input come in. And we also get input from the reticular formation, the spinal cord, and the cortex, the cerebral cortex, so that we are aware of what's going on in our bodies at all time, even though we are not consciously aware of it and the hypothalamus will integrate the entire autonomic response. And of course, there's our hypothalamus right there with the thalamus, which gets all the sensory input. And of course, there's part of our, there's our limbic system surrounding this. So our overall response can be both a physical and an emotional response triggering a physical response, such as the fight or flight response. Hypothalamus will control our blood pressure. It will regulate our heart rate because nothing controls the heart except the heart. The hypothalamus controls our body temperature. It controls uh, how salty or uh, how dilute our body is with water. It controls all of, most of our hormonal activity. It controls our emotional stages. You know, are we happy? Are we sad? Are we angry? Uh, what are our our drives, are we hungry, are we thirsty, what is our sex drive, and how do we respond to fear, and do we trigger the fight or flight response when we need it.